Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to the Muslim Philanthropy Podcast at American Muslim Community Foundation. My name is Muhi Khwaja. And for today's episode, we want to take a deep dive into some of our backgrounds, and we're going to be focusing on me just for a little bit. So let me take a step back and share how we got all of this started, how American Muslim Community Foundation came to be. And we're going to go way back. I was born in Detroit, Michigan back in 1985. My parents moved to Michigan in the 1970s from New York. My father's family migrated from Lucknow, India to Pakistan after partition and settled in Karachi. My mother's family is from Hyderabad, India. My father arrived in New York at Polytechnic Institute, which is now New York University, to complete his master's in metallurgical engineering. After graduating, he got a job at Ford Motor Company, where he worked for 30 years. My mom got her degree in mathematics and raised my siblings and I. I'm the youngest of four. We grew up in Livonia, a suburb of Detroit, in the, which in the 1970s was known as the whitest city in America. In the mid-90s, we moved to Canton, Michigan, where a new mosque had been built, the Muslim community of western suburbs, along with the school, Crescent Academy. It was through this community I saw civic and servant leadership displayed. I could share stories of families who would tirelessly make biryani for hundreds at monthly potlucks, or members who would pick up after everyone else had left, or families that would organize the annual picnic. Some of that, some that were committed to playing basketball weekly or volleyball a few nights a week, everyone together in their own way shaped the feeling that was felt through walking through those doors. Some of these families have moved from Michigan but are still close friends, and others have passed away, and I hold those memories close. Being active in the youth group and seeing my siblings take the lead on different activities, this is what planted the seed for what I do today. I leaned into my skills to organize and build community. Through the mid-90s and 2000s, our community would host dozens of Islamic relief fundraisers where we would raise awareness and funds to support projects for clean water, education, health services, and refugee or orphan advocacy in developing or war-torn countries. This transpired through college, where I was actively involved on campus as an orientation leader, leading Amnesty International, the student body, and playing rugby. Luckily, I had mentors that believed in me all throughout my life, whether it was a teacher, a youth study circle leader, a sibling, a parent, or a friend. So just as every good desi, my career options were to be a doctor or engineer. My brothers took their MCATs, my sister became a teacher, and have all done well for themselves, but none of us ended up as a doctor and engineer, although one brother is a physician assistant. Alhamdulillah, we've all graduated from the University of Michigan with the help of our parents and went on to receive graduate degrees. I was three years into my degree when the auto bailout happened in 2007, and I got let go from an engineering internship. This was a wake-up call for me to look into what I really wanted to do for myself. The fastest way for me to still graduate was to focus on history and psychology. I took my time. Undergrad for me was six and a half years. My senior capstone project was conducting oral history interviews of community members titled Transitioning into a New Neighborhood, Muslim Community of Western Suburbs. The summer before I graduated, I was asked by a friend and mentor, Farhan Latif, who at the time was the Director of Alumni Relations for the University of Michigan Dearborn, to apply for a job through the University of Michigan's Development Summer Internship Program. (laughs) Boy, I'm so glad that I did. In 2009, DSIP showed me how U of M took 500 staff members to run their Office of University Development, where they had staff dedicated solely to the marketing and communications, major gifts, annual fund, and so many other critical positions to raise billions of dollars in their capital campaigns and get to $12.4 billion in their endowment by 2019. We worked four days a week, and on Fridays we took a class in Ann Arbor where then program director Kat Walsh and PhD student, now Dr. Shelley Strickland, taught us on philanthropy And we had amazing guests and various staff members from across the colleges and departments to share what they do. We saw firsthand how the athletic programs and hospital and alumni all played a role. This put Indiana University's Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, their fundraising school, and the Association of Fundraising Professionals, or AFP, on my radar as resources. Through their years, Kat has been another mentor I've engaged along the way. After my internship wrapped up, I stayed on with the University of Michigan Dearborn's 
Alumni Relations Department until I graduated in December of 2009. Farhan was also very engaged with a local nonprofit that was looking for a development professional. The Institute for Social Policy, or ISPU, does research on the American Muslim community, and I was not only their first full-time hire, but their first staff member to focus solely on fundraising. Like many other small nonprofits, they had part-time staff and consultants to help along the way. We were able to work to build the infrastructure of ISP's back-end services, start using a client relationship management tool, build their annual fund, boost their monthly giving program, enhance their events, steward the relationships with their existing donors, and cultivate new relationships across the country through house parties and host committees. I spent two and a half years as an associate development officer at ISPU and went on to pursue my graduate degree at the University of Michigan Dearborn in their nonprofit and public administration program. During this time, I consulted with several organizations, many which you've probably heard of, like Islamic Relief USA, Islamic Society of North America, Islamic Scholarship Fund, Council on American Islamic Relations, Michigan. In that time, I even ran for public office for Plymouth Canton School District's Board of Education. I got married and started a photography business. Little did I know it, but the people I met along the way would become some of my biggest advocates and supporters for American Muslim Community Foundation. The day after my last exam for graduate school, I moved out to the San Francisco Bay Area to work at an organization called Tetleaf Collective in Fremont, California, to do exactly what I did at ISPU, build their infrastructure through implementing the best practices of development. I was their development manager, and I traveled across the country to build relationships with their donors. While I was at ISPU and Tetleaf, I continued to take those courses from Indiana University's fundraising school and got involved with AFP, where I met another mentor, Jack Lotto. Jack always encouraged me to apply for a new role, keep building my professional experience, and become a certified fundraising executive. Through my experiences at ISPU and Tetleaf and consulting for Indian Muslim Relief and Charities, I saw the need for Muslim philanthropy to evolve from what's been an event-centric transactional fundraising experience to relationship-focused charitable giving experiences. This planted the seed for me to one day have the opportunity to do charitable giving for families. After working at Tetley for two years, I landed a job as a major gift officer and senior philanthropy officer at the American Red Cross, working out of San Jose in 2015. Oddly enough, back in Michigan, I applied for a job in Ann Arbor at Red Cross, but it just wasn't the right time. Funny how things come full circle. At Red Cross, I was provided a portfolio of donors to manage and build relationships with. Many tech CEOs and notable figures were in my portfolio. I immersed myself in the mission, giving blood regularly, which I still do, helping when I could during any local wildfires, and helping the local mosques become community shelters and hosts for blood drives. Our region was raising roughly $25 million a year, and after Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria hit, we raised over $100 million annually. There was a whole team at the Red Cross dedicated to foundations, to corporate fundraising, and major gifts. Nationally, Red Cross raises about $1 billion in donations and generates another $2 billion of income from biomedical and training services. You're probably familiar with the Red Cross for their blood drives and disaster relief, but they also do a lot of work globally and locally in the U.S. with military families, youth, providing CPR and health programs, humanitarian law, and international preparedness. I'm proud of the relationships that I was able to build for the donors and the mission of the Red Cross. And each year I was able to increase their giving year over year, retaining donors to raise over more than $1 million annually in the last few years while I worked there, and only from a subset of 200 donors. Over the five years when I was at Red Cross, I was fortunate enough to have the experience to take the exam to become a certified fundraising executive by AFP, and also started presenting at their national and regional conferences, much to Jack's encouragement, along with another AFP member, Navisha Mehta. I earned my CFRE in 2016 and had taken enough courses at Indiana University to earn my CFRM, or Certificate in Fundraising Management, in 2017 where I began teaching since 2019. 
So throughout my time at the Red Cross, I began revisiting the idea of how to evolve Muslim philanthropy. In 2016, I put pen to paper and looked at how the National Christian Foundation and Jewish Community Federation operated. I noticed that there were over 700 regional and national community foundations, but none of them represented the Muslim community. And the Muslim community had thousands of nonprofits, according to the IRS and GuideStar, and had many family and had many family private foundations. The only models that I knew of at the time were a giving circle called Pillars Fund, which operates with the Chicago Community Foundation, has been brilliant, and also the El Hibri Foundation, set up by their own family, which now Farhan Latif is the president of. So traditionally, community foundations offer donor advice funds and endowments, and many are now starting to offer giving circles and fiscal sponsorship. So this was the gap that we were trying to fill as American Muslim Community Foundation. And that's what brings us to today. So as we close, I ask you to think of the following questions. What does philanthropy mean to you? How and if you could solve one issue with charitable giving, what would it be? Is there a verse from the Quran or a story from the Hadith or example of charity that you can think of that inspires you to give? And what's your favorite nonprofit? So as I sign off, reach out to us with your ideas by emailing podcast at amuslimcf.org. Find us online at amuslimcf.org slash podcast on social media platforms at amuslimcf and use the hashtag Muslim Philanthropy. If you're interested in learning more about AMCF, you can support us at muslimcf.org slash donations. And we're really excited to partner with you. Thank you for joining this introductory episode of Muslim Philanthropy. Again, my name is Muhi Khwaja, and each of you have the ability to make the world a better place with your charitable giving. Thank you. Thank you.